Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at NYRB Poets to welcome Najwan Darwish for the release of his new collection, Exhausted on the Cross. Uh, joining him this evening are the translator of that book, Kareem James Abu Zaid, and poet and editor Jeffrey Yang. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I want to give a huge thanks to Najwan and Kareem and Jeffrey for joining us this evening. Uh, Najwan from a very, very late time zone. Um, so to some housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll try to uh, get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button down here through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book if you haven't already. Um, very important. Uh, and a caveat for tonight's event, um, especially because this tonight is an international event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, um, lots of wires between here and everyone else. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Our next partnership event with NYRB will be on March 11th, where we'll, when we'll be welcoming Tom Whalen for a discussion of his new translation of Robert Balzer's stories, Little Snow Landscape, in conversation with NYRB Classics editor Edwin Frank. Again, that program is on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guest and we will get started. Najwan Darwish is, the, is one of the foremost Arabic language poets of his generation, born in Jerusalem in 1978, 30 years after his family was exiled. Since the publication of his first collection in 2000, his poetry has been acclaimed across the Arab world and has been translated into 15 languages. Kareem James Abu Zaid is a translator, editor, writer, teacher, and scholar who works across multiple languages, who has received numerous awards, fellowships, and honors, including Penn Center's USA's 2000, 2017 Translation Prize and a 2018 National Endowment of the Arts Translation Grant. He lives between Southern India and Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Jeffrey Yang is the author of Hey Marfa, Vanishing Line, and An Aquarium. He works as an editor at New Directions and New York Review of Books and lives in Beacon, New York. So stage is yours. Great. Um, thanks, Hal. Thanks, uh, Community Bookstore. And thank you so much, Kareem and Najwan, for being here. Um, this is this very strange space, and we can't see anyone, but <laughs> we can see each other. Um, thanks, everyone who's here. Uh, and um, we're here to celebrate the publication of this book, of no, Najwan Darwish's new book, Exhausted on the Cross, which is probably how we all feel right now. <laughs> so um, this is the second book uh, after Nothing More to Lose that New York uh, Review Poets has published. And this book, I mean, I'm just gonna say a couple little things um, about it, and then um, I'll turn it over to Kareem and Najwan, who will read a little bit, then we'll talk a little bit more and um, come back and, and, and then we'll read some more. So that's kind of the structure of the, of the night. Um, yeah, this book, uh, it's a remarkable collection of, of poems. Um, when you start out and you open with the first poem, you're seeing Mount Carmel, the very sacred, famous mountain outside the window and you're, you're hearing the church bells um, you're hearing the call to prayer from a mosque. You see the Baha'is um, uh, believers, you see the Ahmed uh, believers, you see uh, the followers of Druze, you see this very different picture of what perhaps we perceive of um, that part of the world is. And then from, the, from there, the next poem, we are in Shantila, the Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. Uh, and the main kind of protagonist is the wrong word, but the main person in that poem is an old woman. Uh, in the next poem, we move into the history of, uh, of Hafez, the Arab Hafez in the fifth, 14th century Shiraz. Um, and then we go, the next poem, we're in Gaza and we're uh, seeing a, a boy in um, Gaza. And so it, it's just a remarkable movement of the way the book moves and the way po the poetry um, moves and you don't really notice it as you're reading it. Um, it's very uh, quiet, but it's also until those really, um, I don't, these kind of eruptions happen uh, in, in the poems. And so 
why don't we uh, have you both read, uh, but maybe you could first start by saying a little bit about where you are and what, uh, what's outside your window, perhaps, and, um, and we'll go from there. Thanks. Everyone? Why don't you start, you're kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the uh, countryside, uh, about 15, 20 minute drive outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So uh, I can actually turn around my camera for a second. Uh, it's sunset here, but it's mountains. There's a bit of snow on the ground and uh, we're kind of way out in the country. We have a lot of animals, and, I mean, outside, not in the house <laughs> and snakes and, and things like that. So uh, it's peaceful out here. It's been a good place for, uh, for COVID actually. So that's where I am. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, moderating and for uh, uh, being with the book from the beginning. Um, and thanks also to HAL and Community Bookstore and to Kareem and to everyone joining uh, this evening. As usual, I am at home. Uh, my home always a kind of temporary flat. Uh, and this time I am in one of my temporary homes in Istanbul, in an area called Kadikoy, the village of the Kadi. The Kadi is the judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm searching the, the history of this uh, neighborhood and this judge. I used to be a lawyer. So a lawyer, a, law, um, a fugitive lawyer, in a, the neighborhood, a fugitive uh, judge. <laughs> so Najma, would you, would you like to start first with, um, are you going to read the Arabic uh, first and then to read okay. the yeah, we'll read, yeah, we'll read the Arabic first, Najma will read the Arabic and then I'll read the English. Uh, one or two of the poems that are longer, we'll just do the English. And uh, we're actually going to read one or two that you mentioned uh, in your introduction, Jeffrey. So. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, well, maybe just say one thing. Uh, if people, there, there will be, you know, a brief question and answer. I think uh, you could just kind of throw your questions into the chat if you like, and I think Hal will, will try and moderate some of that at the end. Uh, so okay. وسرقوها كنت أعرف دائما كنت أعرف كنت أنتظر هذا النهار انتظرته مرارا عند المنعطفات في الكوابيس ليس الأمر مروعا سرقوها كنت أعرف أن هذا سيحدث لكن ماذا سأصنع الآن بسمائها الزرقاء ببحرها وجبلها بنفسي وبكل ما تركه اللصوص وراءهم I always knew. I woke up, she wasn't there. Thieves came while I was sleeping and carried her away. I knew it, I always knew. Often at the twists and nightmares, I'd waited for that day. There's no cause for alarm. They stole her and I always knew it would happen. But what should I do now? with her blue sky, with her mountains and sea, with myself and everything else the thieves left behind. Jiratul Karmel, Tujawiru al-Bahr, lakinnaka la tastati'u an tunadi alayh, ya jar tafaddal, ishrab finjana qahwa. في حين أن الكرمل يزورني من النافذة دون أن يستأذن أو يحاول مرة الدخول من الباب هو صاحب الملك على أي حال أحيانا تصلني أجراس كنيسة من قاع واد النسناس وأحيانا يجيئني أذان الفجر خافتا من جامع الاستقلال يحمله النسيم القديم من وادي الصليب أتباع البهاء لا يكفون عن دفع دولار في اليوم وملء المدينة بحدائق هاربة من شراز وفي الكبابير 
لا ينهض أتباع غلام ميرزا أحمد من غيبوبة المديح وتصيد الحق في أحاديث ومرويات أما الأجاويد فمشوقاتهم تصلني من الخلوة الكبيرة عند سفح حرمون مثل هذه المناديل البيض التي تخبئ ليالي ألف سنة من السواد لكن أنا الذي لا أتبع سوى نفسي ما الذي أفعله بين الأتباع بلا هدف بين البحر والجبل هنا حيث ينتهي الزمان Mount Carmel and again uh, Carmel is the uh, as Jeffrey mentioned is the uh, sacred mountain in uh, Haifa uh, and there's a few names in this poem place names Wadi Nisnas Wadi Salib Kababir these are all sort of neighborhoods uh, in Haifa Mount Carmel Though you're right beside it, you can't call out to the sea. Neighbor, come join me for a coffee. Instead, and without my permission, my other neighbor, Carmel, visits me through the window, never trying to enter by the door. It owns the place at any rate. Sometimes the church bells reach me from the depths of Wadi Nisnas, and some mornings the call to prayer comes in quietly from the Istiklal Mosque, born on an ancient breeze from Wadi Salib. And the Baha'is keep giving alms and filling the city with Persian gardens that escaped from Shiraz. And in Kababir, the followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad maintain their naps of devotion and hunt for truth in the Prophet's words. As for the holy men among the Druze, their poems reach me from the temple at the foot of Mount Hermon, like the white headscarves of their women, the ones that hide a thousand years of darkness. And I, aimless between the mountain and the sea, I who follow no one but myself, what am I doing here among all these devotees, here where time has found its end? The next poem uh, I'm just going to read in the English because it's a little bit longer. And uh, this is called A Short Story About the Closing of the Sea. Uh, and it takes place in Gaza. Very different uh, geography from Haifa, obviously. A Short Story About the Closing of the Sea. When you turn down that street at the city's edge, the one that leads to the camp, if you see children leaving that school that resembles a prison, if you see seven of them standing there on the threshold of silence, watching, if you see a slender child whose eyes are gleaming with all the world's promises, you'll have found my friend Taisir. His family has a country that was stolen in broad daylight, and you can see the vigilance of its birds in his anxious eyes. The cement houses, the memories of tin sheets, the voices that were fearful of the occupying army's transceivers through the long weeks of curfew. None of this has taken the slightest spark from his eyes. He saw the sea once and nothing can convince him he won't see it again. When the curfews lifted, we'll take you to the sea. That's how they used to comfort him. When the curfew finally was lifted one day, they said, the sea's closed now, go to sleep. He didn't sleep that night. He imagined an old man who closed the sea by lowering a massive tin sheet that stretched from the star on the horizon to the sand on the shore. The man secured it with a huge padlock, then went back to his home. The padlock was larger than the one on Taisir's father's shop on Omar Mukhtar Street. When you walk down that street at the city's edge, the one that leads to the camp, if you see two eyes gleaming with all the world's promises, ask them, I beg you, if the Gaza Sea has opened yet or if it's still closed.
صبي وزيتون قصتي أنني بلا قصة وسيرتي مكتوبة على مياه هذا الجدول من العبث أن تبحث عني لن تجدني أنا مجرد كلمات رددها صبي على جبل الزيتون وهو يحسب أن الأغصان تحفظها قصتي أنني بلا قصة poem is called The Boy, and uh, there's a little epigraph saying, following Jabra, Ibrahim Jabra, and he was a uh, fairly well-known poet from Jerusalem who was uh, exiled, uh, he lived in exile in Iraq after 1948. The Boy of Olives. My story is I have no story, and my biography's written on the waters of this stream. There's no point searching, you won't find me. I'm merely words a boy recited on the Mount of Olives, thinking the branches would preserve them. My story is, I have no story. Well, are we going to switch to conversation? <laughs> okay, yeah, let's, or, or please, Najwan, did you want to read that now or? We can read it now too, if you want. No, no, it's, it's okay, actually, I missed the order. Okay, no, <laughs> this is all improvised too, so. <laughs> I wish we could share, uh, Najwan is drinking Macedonian wine, just so everyone knows too, so I wish we could share no, that. It's, it's <laughs> In Arabic, we have the same word for coffee and wine in the classic oh. Arabic. Kahwa, it can be for coffee and it can be for wine. That's perfect. <laughs> um, no, thank you uh, for that reading. Um, why don't we start? I mean, there's so much we could talk about, but I wanted to start with um, with Kareem and Najwan, how, how I guess you first started um, translating. Kareem, uh, how you first started translating Najwan. I know you talk a little bit about it in the afterword to Nothing More to Lose. You, 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 you talk about in 2009 or 11 or something, there was a festival mm -hmm. in San Francisco and you were asked to translate. So I, I was just wondering, yeah, if you could talk more about that, how, how you found the work, what made you do it and keep going uh, and yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it's funny, I was just, actually writing about it uh, today, a little essay on, on that was partially about this. And so I had a chance to go back and, and double check all the dates. And uh, it was um, in my emails. And it was 2009, uh, the um, poet Jack Hirschman from San Francisco, um, who uh, may, be, may be listening, I'm not sure. Uh, he had invited Najwan to uh, what was the second international San Francisco Poetry Festival. And um, I was sort of charged with, you know, Jack, it was as simple as Jack writing me and saying, hey, can you translate? I was translating, there were I think two or maybe three Arab, Arab, Arabic language poets at the festival and Najwan was one of them. And um, it was a little bit sad because, do I remember correctly, Najwan, you had sort of trouble, there were problems with Najwan's visa. Well, I, and, got the, I got the visa a week after the end of the festival. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, and so Najwan couldn't come and I wound up reading the Arabic and the English um, for him at the festival. But so I started translating, translating it for that um, probably a month or two before the festival and we, started working together, I think that way, I would ask him questions about the poems. I think it was over email. And um, yeah, I don't know, we worked really well together. The poetry got a great reception there. And then we published some poems here and there. And then, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And uh, um, thanks to your help, Jeffrey, uh, we wound up uh, working on a book together. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But it was kind of, it was not planned from the beginning like that. And it was sort of, uh, I guess, some happy, some good fortune. And, and I was lucky that, that Jack Hirschman was, uh, was familiar with Najwan's poetry. I think he'd read it in 
there had been a couple English translations of individual poems, and there had been some French translations, and I think Jack knew it from that. Uh huh. Yeah. And Najwan, I know um, you have kind of, I would say, a more unique um, process or relationship together in the sense that Kareem, if I'm wrong, you could say, but you you actually send your translations to Najwan, and you Najwan, you give feedback or you. You kind of like you go. So can you can you walk us through a little bit of uh, uh, some of that process or some of the questions that come up as you're you're wrestling? With, I mean, what was your initial? Where you're like, what is this guy doing? Or were you like, wow, this is really impressive? <laughs> I, I'm always joking with Kareem. I say to him, Kareem, if I would imagine if I'm dead poet, how are you gonna do? I'm like a, a a life dictionary. You would ask me, you would consult me. I would tell you this is nice, this is not nice. He would say to me, I wouldn't translate you. I would always translate a live poet. <laughs> so the only advantage of having the poet alive is to help the translator. Yeah, but often that doesn't happen. Often they're not helping. <laughs> so, I <didn't... laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> anyways, continue. <laughs> so uh, th this is the only thing. Sometimes I'm assisting Karim. I, and I, 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 sometimes I try to be a good assistant to, to Karim and his translation. Of course, he's a master. <laughs> but even a master need a good assistant sometimes. And I'm trying to be that. Yeah. And Kareem, do you have, a, I mean, do you often have like questions about, I mean, it, it also in the afterword to this uh, book, you talk a little bit about the various registers uh, uh, Najwan is writing in an Arabic, which, you know, and, and so are you going to him with specific um, questions sometimes or just, or, or is it most of the time just saying, oh, how, how is this, and, you know, and then, and then do you listen to him, like his feedback, or do you, <laughs> or do you, do you say, no, this is better? So there's one jokes that I'm his assistant, but I'm always, that he's, that he's my assistant, but I'm always joking that I'm his secretary. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a two-way street. Um, I think, I, I mean, I translate a lot of different authors, and I think with Najwan, it's quite unique. We work pretty closely together. I've never worked this closely, certainly not in a sustained manner with with any other author. And I mean, the first thing I'll do is, you know, I'll, I'll try to come up with a very rough kind of uh, very literal draft, try to get the meaning on the page and make sure I understand everything. And that's usually, I mean, just today, Nijuan and I were working on some texts uh, today and yesterday. And usually at that phase, uh, there'll be some questions that I have. What's this a reference to? Is this a reference? Sometimes there'll be some dialect in the poems. I'm not uh, very familiar with Palestinian dialect. I mean, I, I know some of it, but uh, my father was Egyptian, so I'm, I'm more familiar with that dialect. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Nijuan is a little bit like a walking encyclopedia. So there'll be, you know, the poems we're working on now, right now are about Afghanistan and they reference, you know, sort of Persian literature. And, and so it's very helpful to be able to ask him that, be, ask him questions about that kind of stuff as well because uh, it just saves me so much time. Otherwise I'd be trying, you know, rummaging through the internet, trying to find uh, some of these sources and stuff. And um, often I'll have a feeling like, well, the, you know, the register is very different in this, po in this poem, what's going on here? So we were working on one and he said, oh, this is, uh, you know, this poem is taking up the Song of Songs, you know, or Song of Solomon, however you want to uh, name it. And so that helped a lot, right? Just knowing that was like, okay, now I can go and read, you know, go back to that. And those are things I don't always catch. So, and then uh, I'd say after the sort of, those kind of questions, I'll usually send Najwan the a more polished translation. And then uh, we'll discuss that and we'll see, you know, maybe some things in English are off the mark. Maybe they're a bit different from the Arabic. We'll talk about the differences. We'll see if it should stay that way or if it should change. And uh, and sometimes, you know, maybe there's some difficult choices that have to be made. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure. And there's two options. And maybe I'll come also with, you know, do you have a preference between these two? What do you think? So mm -hmm. uh, it can be almost anything, really. Um, I'm lucky because Najwan, you know, reads English so well. So it's uh, it's a fortunate position to be in. That's not always the case when I'm translating. Yeah, Najwan, do you consider uh, poetry written in English as 
part of your own poetic tradition? I mean, it adds, I mean, what, I mean, that leads to other questions of how you first came to poetry. Uh, you mentioned being a lawyer later on, uh, but I'm, I'm just curious if, if uh, you were reading these poets who were writing in English from early on along with Arabic poets or was it something that came later? <sighs> Um, English language poetry was never very foreign to me, mm -hmm. though I um, I'm always joking that Arabic is the only language uh, I speak, mm -hmm. uh, and I am having a kind of Google translator in my head because I, I still think in Arabic and translate. And some of my friends would say to me, Najwa, in a public meeting, try to not to speak in English. Uh, you are a little better, a little bit better than Yasser Arafat in English, but you should not speak in, uh, in English. You're gonna destroy your image by speaking in English. You are a better speaker in Arabic. Why you speak in English? Right. And I agree with them. And I said to them, I speak in English out of friendship. I'm always talking to friends. Yes. And when you talk yes. with friends, you should not count much. This is one. Um, so the, 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 the tradition of English language, especially the poetry of the 20th century, uh -huh. I am familiar uh -huh. with. Uh -huh. Maybe, maybe um, I read less uh, uh, old uh, English language poetry. Yeah. Um, the vocabulary, the, the forms, and it is also less attractive for contemporary readers in general. We contemporary readers, we don't get much to the uh, poetry of 17th, 16th and 17th century. We usually read the 20th century uh -huh. when there was a kind of boom in the language of poetry. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And, and with, 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 with my work, I have a kind of sensitivity to the American English. Uh -huh. I, 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 feel, I found it always more open as an English, mm -hmm. for example, th than the, the British English. Right. When, when I see some of my poems in British English, even though they were translated by very good translators and friends, I found them, not me, I found them very much, uh, I would say, uh, official. Uh, uh -huh. um, the, the voice is not so natural, at least for me, maybe because I'm not so familiar with it, but with the language of Karim and with the American English, I, 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 I listen to my voice, some of my poems, uh, my, our poems in English, and I call them our because I also consider them the poems of Karim. I think he's also a, a poet and he's uh, putting his own poetry into the translation. Mm -hmm. I, I listen also to my own voice and my own tone beside his tone and voice as translator. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy about those translations. Yeah. Uh, though yeah. I, some of my work is a little bit um, I wouldn't say difficult, but I do use sometimes classical uh, Arabic and the classical expressions and references. And these are quite difficult in translation, but Karim always find a way, find his way to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to translate them in a beautiful poetry. And yeah. this astonishes me because sometimes I say he wouldn't translate this poem or this line, this, this is very Arabic. But he, he always managed to find a way. Yeah, yeah, I could sense that too um, in the language of the translations. Um, do you have a memory of kind of your first engagement with American English as you're talking about that? Uh, um, or, or was it just something, you know, that you first picked up in a book? Or I, I'm just curious how uh, you. I, I, I'm always like, uh, with poets, I am always close to the to the American English poetry, okay. much more than the the British and the Scottish, right. for example, okay. uh, or, or the Irish. Sometimes the the the, the poet. So um, yeah, yeah. and also we have to say that there was excellent poetry in the twentieth century in general sure. in this uh, part of the world. Yeah, but all of those kinds of poets and books are, are I mean, uh, this is my own ignorance, but act, what were available when you were growing up or later on to, to, uh, to find these books in the original um, English? Yeah, both. I, I read many of them in Arabic, by the way. 
there oh, is a lot of yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So of, the translations of, are, are of good. It, uh, was in Arabic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people and 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 also they are uh, for the poets in the Arab world. It's part of our tradition when we are talking about uh, Ezra Pound or or T. S. Eliot. These are like a kind of part of our tradition. You wouldn't find a poet in the Arab world uh, who didn't read uh, T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound. Right. Really, yes. you, you can find. So uh, this yeah. is part of, 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 uh, of our poetic culture, if you want. And I have to say that the scene in the Arab world or the, the poetry is very open to, uh, to different poetics and especially to the... To the to the English language poetics it has to do with colonialism, English and French. Yeah, they are yeah. very much, uh, uh, which is something I do criticize from time to time because I think we have to be much open to the rest of the world and or to the whole world. You can't uh, just read uh, uh, the 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 Western centrality. Yes. Yes. No, that's interesting. Um, why don't we do the second? part of the reading. I'm just looking at the time and then we'll continue on with the conversation. Uh, um, specifically uh, with, I have a lot to, that I wanted to ask you about this book um, um, and specifically, but uh, I think you wanted me to read the first book. Okay, but will you, will you, would you like to read the, the Arabic first? Najma? Okay. Tanwiyah ala baytayn dirabi al adawiyya. أحبك ثلاثين حبا ليس لأنك أهل لذاك بل لأن الحب الأول ضلل الحب الثاني والثاني أرشد الحب الثالث الذي ضلله الرابع وبين الرابع والثلاثين أضعتك مرارا وفي كل مرة كنت ألقاك ثلاثين مرة ليس لأنك أهل بل لأن الحب الأول ضلل الحب الأخير ثلاثين مرة ليس لأنك بأل أن الثلاثين ليس لأنك بل لأن الثلاثين طريق لا تفضي إلا إلى الحب. Variation on two shots by Rabia al Adawiya. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, Rabia al Adawiya. There's a note, uh, uh, an eighth century Sufi uh, poet and saint. Um, there are two little epigraphs. One, um, the first, after visiting what is believed to be her tomb on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And the next epigraph is the words of Rabia al Adawiya. I love you with two loves, a passionate love and another, because you're worthy of it. I love you with 30 loves, not because you're worthy but because the first love misled the second, and the second guided the third, which the fourth misled in turn. And between the fourth and the thirtieth, I lost you over and over again. Thirty times I lost you. Thirty times I found you again, not because you're worthy, but because the first love led the last astray thirty times. Not because of you, but because thirty was a path that could only lead to love. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh. <laughs> عندما أيقظوك في الفجر إلى رسمية عودة عندما أيقظوك في الفجر عندما علقوك من يدك كالذبيحة مثلك كان المسيح فدائيا لكنهم حكموه وصلبوه في بحر نهار واحد أما أنت فيا لصليبك المرفوع أما أنت فيا لصليبك يرفع كل فجر كان اسمه على القوائم السوداء كانت أمه تنام على وسادة من الكوابيس من يسندها بين نساء قليلات أمام سجن المسكوبية معلقة من يدها إلى أبعد نجمة في الكون أيقظوك في الفجر مرة أخرى علقوك من يدك كالذبيحة. They woke you at dawn to رسمية عودة. 
when they woke you at dawn, when they hung you up for slaughter. Christ was a fidei, just like you, but he was condemned and crucified in the sea of a single day, while you, your cross is raised with every dawn. His name was on their blacklist. His mother slept on a pillow of nightmares. Which of these few women outside the Moscovia jail can catch her when she falls, hanging as she is from the farthest star of the cosmos? They've woken you at dawn again. They've hung you up for slaughter. This next poem, I'm just going to read in uh, English because it's a little bit longer. Um, and it's called In Shatila. And uh, that's a reference to the uh, uh, Palestinian refugee camp, uh, Shatila, that's located in, uh, in Lebanon. In Shatila. There is no dignity here, the old woman tells you the one who left Haifa when she was nine months old. She's 65 now and standing in the swelter outside her house in the camp. She says it all in just a couple seconds. She says it all in just four words. Rivers of regret, years of agony that drown in just four words. You look at her bent back and think of the pines on Mount Carmel. You look into her eyes and remember the kindness of the coast while she complains to you about the faucets and the brackish water that comes out of them. And all you can do is smile as you open your heart to this lovesick child. You know you won't see her again. She won't be there when you head back to Haifa. What did she tell you as she said her goodbyes? What did, you, what did you promise her as you said yours? How could you smile, indifferent to the brackish water of the sea while the barbed wire wrapped around your heart? How could you, you son of a bitch? وصلت إلى هذه المدينة بسبب موعد عرضي مع إمرأة وها هي سنوات سبع تنقضي وأنا فيها تلك المدينة أيضا قطعت الجسر إليها بسبب موعد كان هو الآخر عرضيا كل مكان ذهبت إليه كان بسبب إمرأة ورغم جميع مزاعمي ورغم جميع مزاعم الجوفاء أن النساء بلا دمام فإن دليلي كان دائما امرأة ولدتني امرأة وامرأة أمسكت أصابعي وكتبت وما زالت تكتب حتى بعد موتها كل بيت سكنته بنته امرأة أو ملكته امرأة أو خسرته امرأة بلادي امرأة وهذه الإلهة الأم التي أجر الصليب في شوارعها امرأة وحين كانت جثتي في العراء ممنوعة من الدفن في حياة سابقة خرجت لهم من الظلام لتدفنني امرأة حين لم يصدقني أحد صدقتني امرأة وبسبب امرأة عشت الحياة بالطول والعرض من المؤسف حقا أن الرجال وحدهم سيدفنونني Because of a woman. I came to this city because of a casual date with a woman, and now seven years have gone by. And I crossed the bridge to that other city because of a date with a woman. It too was casual. Everywhere I've gone was because of a woman. And despite all my hollow claims that women are disloyal, my guide was always a woman. A woman gave birth to me, and a woman grabbed my fingers and started writing. And she's still writing 
even after her death. Every house I've ever lived in was built by a woman or owned by a woman or lost by a woman. My country is a woman and this mother goddess whose streets I drag a cross through is also a woman. And in a past life, when my corpse lay out in the open and they forbade them to bury me, it was a woman who emerged from the shadows to lay me in the earth. When no one believed me, a woman believed me. And because of a woman, I lived life to the fullest. It's regrettable that only men will carry my coffin this time around. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you first um, how you arrange this book. I mean, for readers uh, who don't have the book yet, um, when you open it up, you see the contents and each of the seven sections, um, am I right in seven? Yeah, seven sections has a kind of title to the section. And as you're reading the book, you realize that the title of each section is often just a phrase uh, from a poem in that section. Um, so, so for instance, like one of my favorites uh, is in the second section that uh, is titled with the Kaaba on its back. And the line says, nor why the, sound, why, the, why the sands are swirling as if a camel were fleeing with the Kaaba on its back. And that line is just like incredible to me. <laughs> just there's, I, I can't think of anything, imagine a, a storm in the desert like that. But um, can you just say something about, I mean, Kareem too, I mean, uh, about how this book was arranged? Because it's, I, I imagine, I think it's different than the first book, Nothing More to Lose, which was more a kind of selection of early, earlier or uh, like 1998 to 2013 ish of poetry, at which later on, and Najwan, if am I correct, was then published in Arabic. Uh, you have about something like eight or so books published in Arabic. And, and so there was this kind of reverse. Uh, and so it, with this book, it seemed a little different and, and the structure to me or how it was arranged was really profound and, and, and it kind of related so much like to music, to, 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 the, to the content of what you were writing about. And maybe Najwan or Karim, you could start. <laughs> Just Najwan, you want to say something? I mean, Najwan, ordered the, Najwan ordered it, so he should. He should. <laughs> I have some, I have some comments that I'll add. I am happy uh, about uh, uh, that you like the order or you like the arrangement. Yeah. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the questions which are always hunting me is how to build a poetry collection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and recently I'm doing a kind of writing workshop for young poets from the Arab world for 10 young poets from different countries in the Arab world about this subject, how you arrange a poetry collection, how to build it, based on what. So this collection is, as you said, it's seven sections. And usually I'm doing that. Most of my collections are, my recent ones are seven sections. And each section is a collection you can read it by its own. I think it's a kind of uh, 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 based on the music, mainly the music of each of uh, of those sections. The order, it's, it's the craft of the poet. Sometimes do poets do it among the moda in, on every decade, in every decade, you'd find poets arrange their collection in a certain order with sections, without sections, uh, uh -huh. with long titles, with short titles. I'm working within the Arabic tradition and within my tradition, I found this satisfying me because I am not a fan of my work. I need to, um, to be satisfied personally from the work. I need to, 
I needed to to uh, to be in a, in, a, in a kind of order which I would I would I would I may like myself, and yeah. Uh, yeah. I am happy that uh, others may may as well find the order or the structure of the collection satisfying. Um, the second uh, section in the book, the only change in the whole book was that the first section became the second in the English translation. This is the only change. The rest is, uh, is the same. And it's the same book with the same poems. Nothing was deleted from the book. Usually in translation, uh, translators would delete some stuff because it's untranslatable or it was weak. Uh, I was lucky that uh, uh, Karim uh, managed to, uh, to translate it all beautifully and uh, he didn't delete anything, even though he, he has the permission to delete and to do whatever he wants, but uh, <laughs> thanks God he didn't. Well, that's yeah, and that was really the only change uh, between the English and the Arabic was we just, the, what was the second section in the Arabic became the first section in the English. Uh -huh. and vice versa so that that one set that one title that you really like uh, about the as if a camel were fleeing with the cap on its back yeah that one it actually opens the arabic and the reason uh, and again i got Najwan's permission <laughs> to do this because that's a pretty large editorial change um but the reason in arabic it works well to open you know with the you know, what is the second section um, in English? Uh, but I felt, you know, for, for readers who might be new to Najwan's poetry in particular, the, um, the opening, what is now the opening section in English starts with so many different geographies and such mm -hmm. a range of poems. And I thought that would be really good to start it off in English. Um, would, would just give a slightly easier access point to mm -hmm. readers in English. Uh, whereas the next section in English is much darker and the poems are all kind of, they're about death and shadows and darkness. And, and um, I don't know, it felt to me like it, just the English reader would, there was more of a range with that first section. And I felt like it would be a slightly uh, better access point. Um, other than that, the order didn't change, which was was nice. I, it was nice having, you know, our first book, um, Nothing More to Lose, didn't have sections mm -hmm. uh, at all. So it was nice to have a, a different book with different, you know, a sort of different structure um, yeah. this time around. Yeah, and the middle section is kind of this arc into the longest, longest section of the book with these very epigrammatic kind of poems almost. Um, mm. So I don't know, it was interesting uh, the way it kind of like arced in that sense uh, and, and, go, and expands and comes back down. I, don't, I know you meant to do that, Najma. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's nice because each section really is almost like its own little collection. It can be read that way, yeah, which, I, I, which I liked about this. And each one is very different. Like very, I find all seven quite unique, um, yeah. each in their own way. But also they kind of overlap sometimes. I mean, you have Arda, I mean, we're talking about music and, and uh, you, you have these poems. There's so many poems addressed to a singer, to a friend, uh, to a stranger. You talked about death a little bit, Najwan. Sometimes the the speaker is is um, is dead uh, and talking, uh, addressing. Uh, so there there are there are all these very intimate kind of scenes uh, in the poems um, um, addressed. Uh, just an observation. Uh, I guess I mean I there's a lot of other things I wanted to ask. I mean. You also work. Uh, oh, are we? Are we almost? You can ask your last question if you want. We can move to questions oh. too if you'd like. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Um, can I, well, what would you want to say something about your work? I mean, I think this is interesting too, and, and for people would know that you work uh, for uh, the cultural pages at Al Arabi Al Jadid. Um, 
I, I'm just curious how, what, how your your work in, in, with the newspaper is it something that is a burden or something that, that I mean to me it's 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 very interesting that you are involved in 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 that side of things and then you also I didn't know you're also teaching uh, a workshop too for for young so you're very much involved in almost like this kind of pan Arabic. I mean, is that a, that's a bad word to use, but like, but it's all inclusive kind of um, um, kind of project of things. But, yeah. uh, um, always, I'm complaining from <laughs> from my work and from everything I'm doing. But the secret, uh, the, the the truth that I I love it very much. Mm -hmm. I am always complaining to everyone about my editing work, and it's too much. And I'm running a daily newspaper, which doesn't stop and we print every day. But uh, and I, I think I love it, even though I complain of, of it. And also it uh, on, the, on the editorial level, when you are editor, when you in your life edited thousands of texts, it would improve also your own work. The, and the amount of exercises you are doing, I am like someone who's going to the gym five hours every day. <laughs> so I became a kind of athlete in, in my craft. It's different than poets who are only busy of their own work. So this yeah. would give you a variety of things, variety of voices. In, in uh, Al Arabi Al Jadid cultural section, we translate much from the four corners of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I got mm -hmm. the chance to edit the work of uh, poets from all over the world, from uh, uh, almost all languages. So th this would give you a kind of, uh, when it would enrich your poetry and you would be able to embrace other voices. You wouldn't be just uh, busy with your own self. Th this is a great experience. Of course, you would have to pay for this great experience. You would, uh, much of your energy would be in your editorial work. In many days, my poem would be my editing work, my page, the, the two pages I am editing every day, I'm supervising at least every day. This, this is my poem sometimes. I don't write in some of the days, but I'm happy about it. I mean, ne regret rien, as Edith Pierre would say. Perfect. Uh, Hal, can I just say one or two last things uh, before the question? Uh, we didn't get there. I mean, again, there, uh, we, I, I wanted to talk about this too, but um, Raul Zurita, the, the, uh, the great Chilean poet, has written the foreword to this book. Um, people could actually see it uh, on the Parish Review Daily. Um, it's a beautiful piece that starts the book too. Um, and yeah, I just actually just wanted to thank Abigail Dunn to, at New York Review for helping to organize this as well. And so any, yeah, anyway, so if there's questions, I don't know, I, I can't see, really see the chat. Um, oh maybe... yeah, I, I, have, I have some questions, don't, don't oh. worry. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Uh, first question, uh, this will be aimed a little bit more at Kareem. How do you approach translating the musical nature of Arabic into English? From just listening to these readings, it seems like it must be difficult to make that jump. Uh, how do I approach it? I don't know if there's like a method or technique. Um, I guess there's a standard that I apply when I'm working on it is, does it, I mean, the sort of golden rule for me in the end is, does it sound like good poetry in English. And part of that is, you know, sometimes I'll even ask myself, does this sound translated? Yeah. Right, there's, yeah, I do a lot of editing also, and sometimes I edit other people's Arabic translations and I can, I know exactly what the Arabic says because of how they translate it into English, because maybe they kept a grammatical structure that, that wasn't natural um, or something like that. So it's not that I'm trying to take it away from the Arabic, um, not at all, but, uh, maybe, you know, for me, it's, it should stand as poetry on its own in English without the need for a justification of a source text. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If that, that's how I, I work with it. And, uh, maybe just to give one concrete example, um, of sort of, of this kind of thing is the title of the, of this book was very challenging to translate. Um, in Arabic, it's Ta'ab al muallakun which a literal translation, first of all, it starts with a verb, which we can't do. We always, you know, we start with subjects in English, but, uh, you know, it would, the literal translation would be the, the ones hanging, that's al muallakun the people hanging are tired or have grown tired. 
it's just two words in Arabic. So it's very concise, but the ones hanging or tired is not a great title in English. Um, now there's a poem where that comes up. And so I went with exhausted on the cross. I was thinking, what's the image? How can we make it poetic in English? And still for me, it was translating more the image rather than the individual words. And in the, the poem that has that title, that poem is called Exhausted on the Cross. And then the first line is the ones hanging are tired. And it goes from there. But so that's sort of one example of trying to also translate, I would say, the poetic force, the concision, these things rather than just individual words, um, which I think often people think of translation. They think, oh, well, there's here's the Arabic word, here's the English word, and they're just both going to kind of follow each other along. And it, it rarely works like that, uh, certainly not in poetry. Um, it's a it's a hell good of a question. Time. Um, the next question is for Najwan, uh, and I'm going to combine two, two questions together because they're both about sort of the, the influences that are working behind the poems. Um, the first question is uh, for Najwan, what are some of the poets and poems that you keep in mind when you're writing your own? Uh, and the second part of the question is that you had mentioned Eliot and Pound, um, and could you perhaps talk about some of the other English language poets that are read prominently among Palestinian poets? Uh, when when I do write, I don't think of other poets. Um, my poems mostly a kind of either autobiography, a kind of daily biography. I would write uh, a kind of biography, and sometimes it's the it's my nightmares or my dreams. Um, it, it's, it's hard to, it's uncountable amount of poets. Every, I think it, it's it's impossible mission. And even mentioning uh, the two, only two names, it's a mistake from me because you would find uh, tens or maybe hundreds of, of poets who uh, I do read and my colleagues read from the, from, from the, from uh, Northern America or from uh, English language in general. Um, but but one would would mention uh, always there is dear poets, but it's an adventure to mention just a few names in the in in, in a such uh, in a such rush. Um, the one who asks the question, I hope we one day gonna meet and talk much about uh, poets, our beloved poets. She's she's local to poets. Just uh, come visit. Um. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by the next question, which is also for Najwan. Um, how and why did you make the transition from practicing practicing law to writing poetry? Um, I, I, in the beginning, I was a poet who studied law. And uh, I studied law for idealic reasons. And you find out uh, in an in atmosphere which is unideal, you, the, the, the word of lawyers is unideal. Uh, lawyers are sharks vampires, I don't know what I, what I call them. And I didn't get really, be, um, I didn't belong to that society, the society of, of lawyers. And after I did my training and I worked very shortly, I decided that this is not my, uh, this is not my destiny. I don't want to, to be this person who would work a lawyer as a lawyer and earn money. This is not my, uh, my thing. So I, uh, I went back to my, uh, to, my uh, own, uh, uh, to my own way, which was poetry from the beginning. Even at the law school, I didn't consider myself uh, 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 a lawyer. In, in our first class, uh, I remember our professor, he gave us um, his proverb or his uh, uh, life quotation. He said, civil law, will never give you some of it unless you give it all of you. This is, he was talking about civil law, the great professor, Wahid al-Din Siwar, which I dedicated him a poem, uh, Karim translated, and nothing more to lose. So he's talking about just civil law. I have to give all myself to civil law, so, he, so civil law would give me some of it. And I remember myself when he was saying, my son, write this sentence. It was in the first lesson I wrote, Poetry, 
will get, you, you have to give it all of you to give you some of it. And I'm stuck to this rule since the beginning. So I, 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 the only thing which I gave myself fully to was, uh, was, was poetry. And I hope it one, that it may one day give me some of it. I'm not sure. I think you've gotten a little bit of it. <laughs> I hope. I hope. <laughs> you are I, so I kind we, to say so. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question, and I really like this question, so I'm I'm being a I'm 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 controlling this. Um, so th this is this is to both of you, Kareem and and and, and Najwan. Um, uh, at, at one point, uh, uh, Najwan mentioned about uh, made the phrase "speaking in English out of friendship," and uh, this made this this question the questionnaire uh, wonder. Do you have a kind of reader in mind when you write, or Kareem, when you translate? Um, could it be a friend, an enemy, uh, a neutral stranger? Um, and how do you find that that person that you are writing to, in, in Najwan's case, might shift in translation as the book becomes something qu quite different? OK, um, two things. Be be I, first, I saw uh, on the Q&A there is many interesting questions and unfortunately the time wouldn't allow us to answer them. And I want to thank everyone for their questions. But there is a question I can't resist answering, oh, which yeah, is no from uh, Raul Nino. He's asking about uh, Raul Zorita. He's saying at what point was Raul Zorita brought into this project and and he's up, continuing. Um, first, uh, Raul is, uh, a, yani, if there would be a father for the poet, and poets usually don't have fathers, he would be my father. Uh, I love him very much on personal level and poetic level. Uh, and for me, I'm very happy that I lived in the time of Raul Zorita. Uh, I'm enormously touched by his poetry and by his humanity. And for me, he's the model of the poet. If I would teach poetry, I would teach poets to be Raul Zorita, not by copying him, by being so human, so sincere, so brave, and so great as a poet, so elegant, so gifted. Uh, I love Raul and uh, I'm sure he's not listening to us, but he would be somehow maybe sleeping at Chile now or uh, drinking his coffee in Santiago. I would give him, give him, send him all the love that he deserves. And he may live uh, uh, long and his poetry live forever. So this was uh, going for uh, Raul Nino uh, question. I forgot your question, Hal. What was it? <laughs> no, no, no. You are entitled to every question that is asked of you. <laughs> um, no, I, I believe that the question was something to the effect of when you are writing or Kareem, when you are translating, do you have some form of a reader or, or someone you're addressing in mind, whether it is a friend or an enemy or some kind of neutral uh, reader? Uh, yeah, I can. I think that was Ulta Price's question, so I just want to say hi, Ulta, uh, even though I, I can't see you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, she's a wonderful translator uh, herself. Um, I don't know if I have a specific person. I'd say that um, sometimes I do think of my sort of my old translation mentor uh, who passed away a few years ago, C.K. Williams, um, and he was, I, I first took a creative writing seminar with Paul Muldoon, who's also an amazing poet and translator uh, from Ireland. And it was interesting because Paul Muldoon liked everything. He was just interested in whatever text you brought him, he would just gobble it. I had the impression he was gobbling them all up. C.K. Williams was much more critical. Um, and in some ways I think helped me more because of that. But he would often, you know, he'd often, read what I brought. I was an undergraduate, a senior in college. And, you know, he would come in and I translate these very sort of famous poets and he'd, he'd come in and be like, 
you know, Kareem, next week you've got, he'd workshop it first and do it well. And then he'd end it with Kareem, next week you've got to bring in some real poetry. You know, none of this Khalil Gibran bullshit, or I wasn't translating Khalil Gibran, but it was a poet like that. And that was big for me because, you know, I wasn't looking at texts very critically like that. For me, if it was a famous poet, it was, I just, it was good poetry. And so sometimes I think of him. He would also come in when I started translating Adonis, Adonis. He'd often ask me, what does this mean? I'd have all the words, but I, I, all the words would be translated correctly, but the poem didn't make sense in English. So he'd often ask, you know, he'd often come in and say, what does this mean, Karim? So I think he really shaped me quite a lot. So sometimes I think I still hear his voice kind of coming from beyond the grave uh, with those questions. Yeah, and sometimes I'll think of somebody who knows very little about the Middle East, uh, very little about Palestine, and and also try to ask: Is this would this be would this have an impact on on that reader as well? Because uh, I you know my goal is to have the translators reach a a broader audience, you know, not just um, scholars of Arabic or or this kind of thing. So that that comes in a little bit too. I mean, it, it's fascinating though. You're, you're just writing to C.K. Williams. That's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Najwan, do you want a stab at this at this question before we wrap up? Uh, I'm always thinking of a, a friend I don't know. This is when I when I do write. Sometimes I would think of friend I don't know. And among the questions I was um, seeing, I saw two, three political questions, um, and I wouldn't miss the chance to curse the Israeli occupation by the end of this uh, event. Uh, even I'm not in the mood of cursing now, but it's a kind of a duty. It's, it's good to, to denounce the, the colonialism uh, at the end. I would be at least faithful to my, uh, to my principles. We'll, we'll wrap it on that note. All in the book. <laughs> it's all in the book. No, no, but it's it's always my our friends expecting a political statement. You know, uh -huh. it would be it would be dangerous without giving it. <laughs> Especially at these moments, which are a lot of people for forgetting their principles by intention. It's good to to say that, even if you are drunk by coffee. <laughs> <laughs> like me, you know. <laughs> well, uh, I would I want to give this this uh, this uh, uh, reading my my highest regards, which is that as you just sit here and listen to it, all I could think was, "Holy shit, has anyone heard this out loud before?" <laughs> so um, I just want to thank you guys for for joining us and reading that out loud to everyone who joined. Um, Jeffrey, thank you so much for for your great questions for uh, for guiding the conversation. Um, Kareem and Najwan. We can't thank you enough for joining. Najwan, thank you for staying up. I know apparently this is your lunchtime uh, where you are. So thank you, Hal. Thank you very thanks much. Hal. Really thanks nice all. To, uh, to share it. It's quite solitary work when you're doing it. So it's really nice to, to share it with folks. We will do it again. Um, okay. So otherwise, everyone, thank you for joining. Have a lovely night. <laughs>